Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the service of healing and Holy Eucharist. Uh, I want to remind you that something new that we're doing for this very intimate service is we also have an online audience. So I welcome that online audience and invite you into this space of healing with us. Uh, I'm the Reverend Adrian Cook, and I'm delighted that you're here in person and online. And I do want to remind you that if you come up for prayer, uh, that the microphones are turned off, and so no one online or in, in this space can hear what, um, what you're asking for for prayer. So we continue to allow that to be an intimate space. Thanks for being here. Peace be in this place and all who dwell in it. Let us pray. O God of peace, you have taught us that in returning and rest we shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be our strength. By the might of your spirit, lift us, we pray, to your presence, where we may be still and know that you are God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Please turn in your bulletins to page 5, and we will read Psalm 91 responsively by half verse. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, he shall say to the Lord, You are my refuge and my stronghold. He shall deliver you from the snare of the hunter. And from the deadly he will cover you with his pinions, and you shall find refuge under his wings. His faithfulness shall be shield and weapon. You shall not be afraid of any terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, of the plague that stalks in the darkness. A thousand shall fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand. Your eyes have only to behold, because you have made the Lord your refuge. There shall no evil happen to you, For he shall give his angels charge over you. They shall bear you in their hands. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder. Because he is bound to me in love, therefore will I deliver him. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. With long life I will satisfy him. And show him my salvation. 
The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to John. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because it has been, he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. The Gospel of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of the living God, blessed Trinity, and lover of your souls. Amen. You may be seated. I was a new chaplain, and I received my first call that someone was near death. So I stood in silence as I entered the room and I watched the man's children weep as they whispered their love for him into his ear. And I found that I had no good words to say. So I was quiet. And I waited until the room grew quiet. And then I asked, are you ready to let him go? And the daughter nearest him nodded to me. And I raised my prayer book, and I read, Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant John. Acknowledge, we humbly ask you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. And at the words, receive him into the arms of your mercy, there was an audible hiss from his lips. The monitor flashed and flatlined. The daughter, wide-eyed, looked at me in wonder and said with a shrug, but he was Jewish. <laughs> and she let out a small laugh. I was a new chaplain. They were a very gracious family. I ended up doing the funeral for them. But I learned that day that when death approaches, sometimes it invites a little bit of comic relief. There's a deep breath that we all take at this strange moment we cannot understand. Death is strange and it's heavy and we don't always know how to carry it. So sometimes we cover it up. We cover up whatever we're feeling underneath and we look for other emotions to feel in those moments. Sometimes for distractions and sometimes just because it's too heavy to feel all of the things happening when someone dies. I learned as a hospital chaplain that the most common emotion that I experienced in the hospital setting was the emotion of anxiety, just prevalent everywhere. And certainly there are other emotions bubbling underneath, but most 
are most acutely aware of their own fear. We're all afraid for our lives at times. And especially in the hospital setting, aware of our fragility, how, how near death can be to each one of us. Today's Old Testament reading, death is described as the shroud that is cast over all peoples, a sheet that is spread over all nations. This covering up imagery is used by the prophet Isaiah. And it's this imagery that invites us into the reality that human beings don't escape death except for the man in today's gospel lesson. Lazarus, right? Lazarus, Mary, Martha, these are friends of Jesus. And this passage of Lazarus' resurrection is well known for a number of reasons. The most significant, people don't rise from the dead. But also, this is the only story in scripture where we ever see Jesus cry. Right? This is the moment the crowds tell us in the text how much Jesus must have loved his friends. Jesus' sadness and his love are often the emotional focal point for the reader to understand how and why resurrection is happening in this moment. God in Christ is just as sad at death as we are. And his love for his friend seems powerful enough to raise him from the dead. But for me, that explanation falls a little bit flat. Like there's an emotion missing. My sadness has rarely driven me to do any great deed. Sadness, in my experience, often has the opposite effect of than inciting action. It can be debilitating. Sadness can be a cause for inaction. I don't know that I, I buy it that sadness and love alone is, are what drove Jesus to this most remarkable miracle we've yet seen in his earthly ministry. I don't know if sadness and love can drive Jesus to bring about resurrection. So what emotion could be missing? Well, according to the text, the emotion Jesus feels over and over again is translated in English as greatly disturbed. Jesus is greatly disturbed. The first time it happens is right when he arrives on the scene. Mary weeps at the death of her brother. The Jews are also weeping. And in the Greek, this word for weep means to wail loudly. So this is, this is a loud event. Now the emotion behind the wailing is not the emotion that Jesus is said to feel when he weeps. Although it is an emotion we have to contend with in this story because it looks a lot like the emotion Jesus feels when he weeps. See, there's a kind of grief, grief whose most appropriate expression is a wail. And I want to talk about this through a story. This is a story that NPR put out a few years ago. And it really struck me when I heard it. In 1967, anthropologists Renato and Shelley Rizaldo went to live among a native people, the Alongat people, an isolated tribe that was known for headhunting. They lived in the rainforest of the Philippines. For 14 years, this couple studied the tribe and learned their language. But there was always one word that eluded translation. Ligat. The best explanation for the word that the Alonga people could come up with was, well, it's the emotion that we feel as a people that made us want to take a human head and throw it. Hard for uh, Americans to translate, right? But they described it as this communal feeling of being uncontrolled, unmoored, that led to this tribal history of headhunting. The Rosaldos admitted they had never quite felt an emotion like that. 
They didn't know what the Alanga people meant until one day when they did. Shelley Rosaldo went on a hike to a different village and she fell off of a 65 foot cliff to her death. And when her husband Renato crouched next to his wife's body, he wrote, I felt the seed of an alien emotion I had never experienced begin to grow inside of me. He didn't have any awareness other than this seed that was in him. He went back to America after the funeral and resettling into daily life. This feeling continued to grow, but Renato did not know how to express it, how to define it. And then one afternoon as he was driving down the sunny street of Palo Alto, California, he couldn't bear the seed of that emotion any longer. He said he just pulled uh, to the side of the road for seemingly no reason, and he began to howl, to roar and howl. And he said he knew in that moment, this is like it. And he began to finally begin to describe the emotion. And he said, I think the English word that best describes Liget might be the phrase high voltage, a powerful energy running through and out of the body. Renato, he felt like he had no control in that moment of when the feeling would come, how long it would stay. Liget stayed with him for a while. He could feel it and it shot through him like lightning. But there was nothing in the American palette of emotions or in mainstream books about death that helped him to understand it. He just knew he had to howl. And because Renato could now grasp this force and the meaning of the word liget, he was finally beginning to be able to make some sense out of the chaos of his own emotional landscape at the death of his wife. He said he was able to give his emotions form in the howl and let them pass through his body. And he could begin to heal. This idea is very similar to the wailing at death in Jewish tradition that is described in the Hebrew Bible. Jesus sees the communal experience of Liget at the death of his friend Lazarus. Everyone is wailing uncontrollably but not Jesus. Mary says to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And in response, it seems as though Jesus sheds a silent tear. Because the text says he feels embrima amahi, greatly disturbed. Later in the story, when Jesus comes before the tomb where Lazarus is laid, he feels it again. Embrima amai. Again, he's greatly disturbed. But what does it mean? It's not the same word for whale. It's not like, it's not like ligate. It's a word that's lost in translation also. And English Bibles are all over the map as they try to describe this word. I'm curious as to what's happening in your own heads. What is this word? What might it mean? If I said I'm greatly disturbed, what do you think I'm feeling? So here's a clue. The word bream a in Greek means to snort like a horse. Does that help? <laughs> That's the root that, where this word comes from, to snort like a horse. While that imagery shows up in other ancient languages, including ancient Hebrew, for words associated with anger. Uh, when, we, when we snort, the sort of, you know, trying to get it out. Something, something you don't want there and get it out. But it's forceful. So it's often associated with anger. I wonder if Jesus was weeping out of anger. Strange, right? Everyone is sobbing uncontrollably, and Jesus is huffing at, and puffing <laughs> at what is going on. 
snorting his way through the experience. So angry, perhaps, that the author reminds us of Jesus' emotion twice. Everybody's wailing, and Jesus is snorting. And then it says he cries. And then the text says, everybody, he must have loved his friends so much. Well, yes, of course. But Jesus' emotions seemed complicated that day. He was angry at something while he was also sad at the death of his friend. I'm going to keep doing some word plays here. And you may have even heard me mention this in, in a sermon elsewhere. But the roots of the word anger in English tradition come from the Nordic word for grief. These words are connected. Our grief and our anger etymo etymologically are connected in English. But in this text, they're connected. Jesus is angry and he's weeping. Right? So like the others in this passage, Jesus too experiences an overwhelming emotion. But it's not the uncontrolled one, like the ligate, the voltage that's shooting through everyone else in the space. And it's not paralyzing, like my experience of grief often is. Those moments we feel like we can't do anything. Like the moment when Renato's wife Shelley fell off that cliff and he didn't feel a thing. He didn't know what to do. What Jesus feels in the face of death, this human enemy so terrifying that for the rest of us we wail or we freeze Jesus seems to feel anger. And that anger is what I imagine is able to fuel him to action. Our translation today read deeply disturbed, but some other translations read deeply moved. Deeply moved, that ability to act. Jesus' grief produces an anger that can move him into action. I imagine we all have our own individual experiences of death, the kind that can bring out the wail of Ligate. COVID-19 has also cast this shroud over the world, like Isaiah talked about, a sheet spread over all nations. But as Christians, sitting with the reality of death. To follow in Jesus' footsteps, footsteps, to be little Christ, little Christians. We're called to do something different, I think, with our grief. Our grief can also be rooted in the anger that death is a reality that shouldn't be. Our gospel, core message of our gospel is resurrection. So I invite you to consider if there are Lazaruses in your own life. Is there a situation you're called to or that just is in your world that could be described like Mary describes the scene when Jesus arrives? It stinks. It's dead and it stinks. It's a horrid thing. Maybe it stinks of death for yourself or for others. I invite you to consider that as Christians, we're called to stand before what others say is already dead, like Jesus did. And by the power of God and the emotions that God has given us, find the strength and the companionship in Christ to give new life. Amen.
using the prayer list. Please keep those on the list in your prayers silently or aloud. On page seven. Holy God, your son lost his life that we might find ours. Be near to those who are losing their life today. Be near us, O God. Where your children are near to death, fill their aching hearts with hope, their grieving families with love, their final moments with grace. Be near us, O God. Where your children are throwing their futures away through reckless living, cycles of addiction, or lunges of despair, bring them new patience, deeper hope, and courageous friends. Yes. And where your children are facing acutely the cost of discipleship, the sacrifice of faithfulness, or the fear that their labors have been in vain, give them a double portion of your spirit. Yes. yes. In Christ, you wholly abandon yourself to us. Embrace those who feel wholly abandoned. Embrace us, O God. Be close to all who walk the long road of instability and mental well-being. And bless those who find it hard to sustain relationships of permanence and trust. Embrace us, O God. Be our companion when we feel abandoned in grief, when we yearn for words of comfort, but find them hard to hear. Embrace us, O God. Speak to the hearts of all who feel abandoned in faith and a long way from your intimate touch. Embrace us, O God. Bring relief to those who are in physical pain and know it is only going to get worse. Wondrous God, in Jesus we discover that nothing is impossible with you. Encourage all who face mountainous debts and give hope to those whom mortgage payments are an unbearable burden. You may make a way Bless organizations in our city that provide capital for first-time homeowners and the small businesses and prosper the work of those building a new future. Make, make a way. way. Shelter any who know they have done something terribly wrong and can't face the pain of those they have scarred and wounded or the shame of showing their face in public. You make, make a way, way where there is no way. Cherish all whose dreams have been shattered and uphold their tender hearts that they may learn to dream again. You make a way where there is no way. Be near us, O oh God, in grief, in despair, in temptation, in pain, and in fear, and give us strength to bear us through the days when clouds gather above us and the earth shakes beneath us. Be near, near us, O oh God that we might look to the wounded hands of your Son and the sustaining grace of your Holy Spirit and say, It is well, it is well with my soul. Compassionate God, you so love the world that you sent us Jesus to bear our infirmities and afflictions. Through acts of healing, he revealed you as the true source of health and salvation. For the sake of your Christ, who suffered and died for us, conquered death, and now reigns with you in glory, hear the cry of your people. Have mercy on us, make us whole, and bring us at last into the fullness of your eternal life. Amen. Let us confess our need for God's healing grace. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, 
in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. You may be seated. Savior of the world, you have redeemed us. If you would like prayers for healing, I invite you to come forward and share a little bit about the prayer that you would like or, or give your name if that's all that you can say. And I will offer a prayer and an anointing with oil.
generous God, we give you thanks for your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, in whom you have shared the beauty and pain of human life. Look with compassion upon all for whom we pray and strengthen us to be your instruments of healing in the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please share as you are able a sign of Christ's peace with one another. I invite you to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right to glorify you, Holy One, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true dwelling in light inaccessible from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness, you made all things and filled them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day, and beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them, and giving voice to every creature under heaven. We acclaim you and glorify your name as we say. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We acclaim you, holy God, glorious in power. Your mighty works reveal your wisdom and love. You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care, so that in obedience to you, our creator, we might rule and serve your creatures. When our disobedience took us far from you, you did not abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy, you came to our help, so that in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again, you called us into covenant with you, and through the prophets, you taught us to hope for salvation. Holy God, you loved the world so much that in the fullness of time, you sent your only Son to be our Savior. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Jesus lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation. To prisoners, freedom. To the sorrowful, joy. 
To fulfill your purpose, Jesus gave himself up to death and rising from the grave, destroyed death and made the whole creation new. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for Christ who died and rose for us, you sent the Holy Spirit, your own first gift for those who believe, to complete your work in the world and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for Jesus to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Almighty God, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and descent among the dead, proclaiming Christ's resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting Christ's coming in glory and offering to you from the gifts you have given us this bread and this cup. We praise you and we bless you. We praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we pray to you, Lord our God. God, our creator, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. And grant that we may find our inheritance with all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God and Creator, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Please join me in the post-communion prayer, which can be found on page 14 of your bulletin. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. May the light of the Holy Spirit shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the face of Christ turn towards you and give you peace. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Debbie's always got an hallelujah in her heart. <laughs> Yeah, I can come for a little bit. I have um I have to leave by two. Oh no, I have a one thirty meeting. I have to leave by one thirty. Yeah. Yeah, I don't need food, but I'll come and sit with everybody for a bit. Thank you, Pam. Oh, good. I'm glad that you were here. You all make it a lovely service. Go into that the clear one, yep. And you can actually, we actually put the gluten free.